Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Ulrich, and I'm the Associate Dean for Teacher Education and Undergraduate Affairs. And on behalf of Dean Penny Hamrick, who unfortunately was unable to attend today, um, and, and on behalf of, of course, our administration, our faculty, our staff, and our students um, in the Drexel University School of Education, it is my distinct honor to welcome Acting Secretary of Education for Pennsylvania, Noe Ortega. Noe Ortega was nominated to serve as Secretary of Education in October 2020. Prior to his nomination, he served as Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Education and Commissioner for the Office of Post-Secondary and Higher Education at the Pennsylvania Department of Education. As Commissioner for Higher Education, he led the work of the agency aimed at closing the post-secondary attainment gaps that have persisted among historically underrepresented populations and communities of color in Pennsylvania. Additionally, Mr. Ortega facilitated the efforts of the department to improve the diversity of Pennsylvania's educator workforce and to ensure that every student in the Commonwealth had access to educators who had been trained in culturally responsive and culturally relevant approaches to teaching and learning in the classroom. Prior to joining PDE, Mr. Ortega spent eight years at the University of Michigan, where he held several academic and administrative roles. Um, during his tenure, he worked as the Assistant Director and Senior Research Associate at the National Center for Institutional Diversity and as the Managing Director for the National Forum on Higher Education for the Public Good. While most of his research focused on post-secondary access and success for all students, his most recent publications examine how public investment in higher education influences decision-making at colleges and universities. Additionally, Mr. Ortega spent nearly a decade working in the areas of financial aid and enrollment management at both public and private universities in Texas, and also served as a P-16 specialist for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Mr. Ortega also spent nearly seven years as director of a language institute in Japan where he trained teachers in the area of early childhood language acquisition. Mr. Ortega has been an incredible partner to the Drexel School of Education, particularly in our work with the Aspire to Educate grant and with our teacher residency work. We are absolutely thrilled to have him here visiting us today with his incredibly busy schedule. Um, so can everyone please join me in welcoming our Acting Secretary of Education for Pennsylvania, Noe Ortega. Dr. Ulrich, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, Dean Hamrick and, and uh, others who also reached out to me early on, I wanna thank you as well. And of course, all the folks who helped sort of organize this today, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to Patty and Eric as well for dealing with the technical logistics that have become such an important part of our day-to-day -day work during the pandemic, of course. So I am Noe Ortega, currently serving as the Acting Secretary um, for Education at the Department of Education. Um, today, I decided to sort of bring to you a few ideas around some of the strategy the department has. I think it's also important to give you an insight into sort of the framing that we use as, as in the department in our thinking as we think about priorities and agenda items and concerns moving forward. It's obvious that my socialization continues to play a big role in the way that I think about issues in education, particularly those tied to post-secondary and higher education. And so I've titled this uh, presentation today after a lot of the work that I've done in the past that I think has become even that much more meaningful and relevant in the contemporary context, right? So this will be an insight into our goal and strategy of reclaiming the public good mission of higher education, but truly of education in, at large as well. You're muted. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? 
I'll start with a little bit about the Department of Education. It's important for you to understand how we approach and think about our work, because I think that's a really interesting uh, uh, or an interesting context into how we think about outcomes as well. So as a department, what we have to realize is where our sphere of influence is, where our unit of analysis should be when it comes to outcomes as we measure them for post-secondary and educational attainment in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We are a state agency with legitimating authority. So when we partner with schools with initiatives like the Aspiring to Educate, which we've done with Drexel University School of Education, we are in some ways legitimizing the importance at the state level for things like compositional diversity in the educator workforce, along with the kinds of competencies that our educators are prepared with when they go into the workforce. And so as a department, you begin to think about also setting the conditions for what would be success or conditions that would allow or be conducive for our institutional partners, our education systems, our LEAs to all be successful as well. And so in many ways we create conditions as well. And then we provide oversight on certain things. And I think these are really important because when we think about the sphere of influence that we have, it is our partners, particularly institutions like Drexel that have the biggest impact at the local level, whether it's the student outcome or the outcomes that are tied to the engaged institution with the community. And those are really important distinctions to draw because what we put in place and how we can be the most effective as a partner is to be able to do that. I share that insight with you because in some ways it speaks to why the orientation of many things that I talk about in our priorities have a lot to do with thinking about the system and then the interaction of all the institutions and education agencies and community members that exist within that system as well. One of the things that I kind of want to lay uh, shed context on is what is informing the agenda and priorities of the department. And this is really important when we think about a context. I call out the pandemic because it's been so pronounced in a lot of the work that not just our agency is doing and other agencies at the Commonwealth, but our institutions, our schools. It's affecting the lives uh, of our families, our friends, our loved ones, but also in the way that we are interacting with it in our day-to-day -day activities. So the pandemic has come to play a huge part in the framing the priorities of the department as we move forward. So how so? In many ways, it sheds lights on th some things that are extremely important for us to begin to understand and unpack, right? For starters, the, in, the effect that the pandemic has had in many ways has really made more pronounced a lot of the inequities that have long persisted in the systems of education, right? When we moved and we had to move abruptly in March, when we pivoted from in-person face-to-face instruction to remote learning, a few things were learned in terms of access, in terms of understanding the environments that many young people were being asked uh, to move to or retreat to and continue with their learning. And some of the lessons there was the obvious that not everybody had the same level of access to uh, tools that needed to continue and not disrupt their learning. But even when folks were engaged in remote learning and being asked to continue learning from their own homes in many places, whether it was continuing to stay in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or moving back to their home state, it did not necessarily account for whether or not those conditions were conducive for learning or safe places where learning could happen. And so in many ways, those are the kinds of things that we became aware of uh, or more aware of when we began to think about what was happening in terms of the provision of instruction. But it also forced us to understand that our institutions, our schools, our LEAs were more than just about the provision of instruction. For many of us sitting here, this is what we've spent our entire academic careers pursuing the understanding of the context involved with education. But in many circles where these conversations happen, not everyone accounts for the fact that our institutions of higher education provide life-sustaining services in many cases for a lot of young folks, including our schools, K through 12. This includes something as simple as facilities for living that create space, spaces that are safe and conducive for learning. But this also means the provision of food in many cases or making up, making up for where food provision does not exist, right? Food insecurity and efforts that some of our institutions and school has. In the K through 12, for many young kids, 
This was really the only warm meal or nutritious meal they had throughout a day. And then when you begin to unpack even further and you understand the role that school play in not just learning, but the provision of mental health services, services tied to well-being, and all the things that it provides, you begin to really understand how significant this disruption has been. And this is one of the things that's really informing the ideas of the department in two ways. To be sure that we continue to shed light on many of the inequities that are sort of played out and more people are aware of and make sure that they don't forget, but to also understand that we're gonna have to figure out how to continue to move forward and reconstruct, rebuild, and return to some level of normalcy. So I shed light on the pandemic in terms of some of the things that will influence. There's also expectations and requirements. Our context is so not removed from federal, state, and even local requirements and expectations that exist, not just on the agency, but schools themselves. So in many ways, when I talk about the context of the Department of Education, it can very simply replace that entity at the center of this ecology with your school of education or your university or cities and communities. Everyone is being constrained to a certain extent by the same level of expectations. And many of these have not been consistent. They've been incongruent at times. We've seen federal recommendations that in many ways um, were not always easy to make sense of. They were ambiguous and often misaligned to where we were trying to head as a state agency and institutions. It makes it more difficult to provide guidance uh, during a time where there's a great deal of uncertainty and ambiguity surrounding some of these things. Sometimes there were the expectations that were coming from us from a federal level were in direct conflict with what we're trying to do, creating tension with some of the directions that the administration and the department was headed. And I think that's set true for many institutions as well. And so our job as an agency in setting priorities is to begin to reconcile that part of the context as well. There's also a piece about this that's around the social, economic, and political pressures. Many things are happening in our society that are influencing the way that we think about our priorities at the agency, likewise at our institutions. We've begun to see a number of things that have affected us effectively, in many ways disrupted sort of learning and people's ability to focus. And we have to continue to be aware of those to factor them to the agendas that we're setting. Economics continue to be uh, a challenge and a constraint for the agency as well as our institutional partners. When we think just a decade ago, we were moving past the great recession, beginning to uh, renew some of the investments in education, We've done a really good job in continuing to at least maintain level funding in that area. And now we find ourselves once again set back as we try to gain progress in this area. And clearly the economic pressures factor into our, to our agenda setting. And then there's of course the political pressures uh, that continue to play out in a number of ways. And these are not just at the federal level, these are local political pressures and also playing out at the state level. It's our job to sort of think about this context as we began to set priorities and agendas. So I wanted to sort of just give you an insight of some of the things that we've been thinking about. And this is also creating a great deal of constraint. It's crowding out some of the agenda items that the administration had set before, and we need to figure out how to work with our partners to begin to address it, right? So this is the background of the thinking that goes into how we set priorities. And I thought it would be important to sort of share uh, this with, uh, with everyone so you can get a sense of where we are and how we're thinking about, our, about priorities. And then these are also useful frameworks to guide how you make sense of some of the thinking the department does as well. There's also the aspect of <clears throat> our agenda setting that is really informed by executive succession, right? So we go from a change of a previous secretary to myself. And so there's an element that goes into this that's really about the agenda and the framing and the identity of the individual coming in. And I don't wanna remove that from the equation because I think what I'm about to share with you in terms of thinking of the department also is influenced by sort of the experience and some of the ideas that I bring in, in with my leadership as well, which I think would be important to shed light on. I wanna spend some time talking about the social, economic, and political pressures, because I think given the timing of how a week ago we were removed from some events that many of us witnessed that I think 
continue to add uh, more significance to the pressures that we're feeling in the political environment. I think it's important to, to shed some context on how we're thinking about this. I will also note here that I probably should offer a trigger warning with some of the things that I'm about to share in terms of images. And so I wanna encourage folks who, who feel like that might be uncomfortable uh, to also know that you're welcome. Uh, I just wanna give you an advance notice that I'll be sharing some images that might bother some people uh, and make you uncomfortable. But the political pressures that we've begun to see on education in general have created a tremendous amount of concerns, right? We've seen trust eroded. In many ways, we would describe this as a crisis of trust, right? The trust of institutions that were set up to protect, serve, and educate us, right? When I think about the education aspect of this, we can't help to, to understand how central we are to this. Politically, we've seen a lot of the national discourse or the discourse around return on investments to education, educational attainment come into question. The significance of our institutions that educate young folks, whether they're post-secondary or in the K to 12 realm or in any area of the sector have come into question. Lots of pushback with regards to outcomes and many of us have been made aware of some of those dialogues and it's really eroded how some people think about the institution of education, but it's not reserved only to education. It's reserved to a number of other institutions that have also had fractured trust as well. And so a lot of the things that we deal with on a regular basis for us as a department has to do with understanding that we are required, almost expected to think about how we're gonna renew and rebuild this trust with the communities and the publics that we serve, right? And so. When I think about the Pennsylvania of education and our thinking and framing of all the ideas for our agenda, all these individual elements that I shared with you now are extremely important. When we think about trust and when we think about the role of education, education has long offered some frameworks for making sense of the events that we see around us. And for us, this is what we need to begin to see ourselves as a state education agency in our discourse. How do we reestablish education as a place where it's important that we offer framing and orientation to help young folks or learners at any age make sense of the events that were going around us. When I think about the recent events that we saw at the insurrection on January 6th, Lots of concerns emerge into how, what happens when, dis, when trust erodes and people begin to push back with strong, strong value-laden approaches to the institutions that they feel have failed them. And in many ways, we need to begin to sort of understand the kind of context that we're living in. But I think as a department, it's important for us to also work with our institutional partners to begin to make sense of what we're seeing around us, to understand that embedded within the context of what we're seeing around in the public discourse is a great deal of text and even subtext that we need to begin to unpack, which I think is really important. When I think about the recent events and I think about what we've experienced in the last several years while I've been at the agency, this wasn't the first time we've seen civil unrest play out. We saw it in Charlottesville where we really began to see some realities tied to what we saw recently that began to paint a different picture of what we've seen, right? These are tensions that go beyond something directed at an institution like the government or an agency just like the Department of Education and fall along the lines of thinking about race and race relations as well. And it's begun to paint that kind of picture that's an important context for us to even consider. But it doesn't end there. We've seen a number of pushback as well as distrust, uh, distrust that folks may have at systems that were set up to protect them. And in many ways, feeling that they're not serving them well. Folks who have been left out of narratives, including education, who are looking to reclaim their position in that narrative and also pushing back. I don't mean to conflate these all together, but I just wanna point out that the distrust is, is playing out in a number of ways. And as an agency, particularly charged with representing education, we must begin to elevate these into our narratives and really inform our thinking. 
because these are issues that we need to figure out how we're going to address in what we put forward as an agency's priority. And these are also issues playing out locally in places like Philadelphia, very close to a home like Drexel, where we see the events that cost the life of Mr. Walter Wallace Jr. as well. So folks are beginning to, experiencing the, to experience a number of these elements and looking for ways to begin to make sense of it. Education has long been the place where not just innovation happens, but folks learn the cognitive skills, the scripts needed to begin to make sense of the events that they're unfolding on the world and begin to process them and understand what is at play here, right? What are the issues of race that are playing out in a lot of things that we're doing? What of this has to do with discourse that's harmful to young people? And how can we establish the capacity to be able to address these things to make society better? but also to use them as a way to construct knowledge. So that way we learn from the things that we're observing now and fold them into the future, right? So these events occurring really remind us of some things that I think to me speak to the narrative of higher education, its contention. I chose these two images to highlight here because I think what you really see here is some protection happening from folks holding on to something that they feel they're losing grasp of. When I think about the work that I did at the National Center for Institutional Diversity that was set up during Prop 2, which was the time where people were questioning diversity um, processes for admissions practices to get all the way to the Supreme Court where the University of Michigan was able to defend it. And then only to come back home and then a few months later, see that defense of that value that they held core to their uh, institution ripped from them through actions taken by the General Assembly. In many ways, it's that protection that I think is important to sort of highlight on what is happening here because this is what we're seeing when we have tensions with regards to access in admissions in higher education as well. Folks hold on to something that really is a pathway to their own mobility, to their own continued privilege. And in many ways, this represents to me the protections of that as well as folks push back and fight, but it's also troubling because what's really at play here is an idea to protect an institution to be accessed from other people. And so I think that's a real important thing to begin to make sense of. I share this with you because I wanna make sure that number one, I make it clear that the department is not tone deaf to the events going on. And folks of us like myself and others who are in leadership positions are really moving to begin to understand how this is going to fit on our priorities. Most recently, Governor Wolf announced that a key aspect of his platform is going to be tied directly to addressing systemic racism. In fact, he, he named it, he called it out as dismantling systemic racism in our society, not just because it's a moral imperative, but it makes the society better. And in many ways, it's informed by the events that we've observed and experienced over the past year. And so I wanted to make sure that I took a moment to sort of orient and frame for you all the aspects that are influencing the agenda of the department in the moment, from the obvious social, political, economic challenges to the pandemic that we're seeing, to the real live events that many of us are not just observing, but experiencing, and in some cases living. And these are the things that we need to be sure go into our thinking for the department. So as I think about the Department of Education's agenda, I'll share with you a few things of how we look at navigating a pathway forward. Much of my orientation into the thinking and the way that I make sense of events really comes from an organizational lens, right? I spent a lot of time studying a lot of the positive organizational scholars, but also organizational scholars that really speak to how do organizations and even systems respond to these types of events that are occurring all the time? And I think in some ways, it's what I've used to put forward some of the ideas. And to just completely uh, uh, share with you sort of some three paths that most people will link with response by organizations to these kind of environmental constraints. You know, you either adapt, which uh, we've seen happen throughout the pandemic, or you advocate to see if you can change the environment. This is where you refuse to accept the constraints as being deterministic and instead push back and make changes at the environmental level, or you do nothing 
and your risk survival, right? This is an oversimplification of some very complex theoretical constructs and propositions, but nevertheless, gives you an understanding of some of the things that we put out there. The department strategy is to do the following, to adapt when necessary, but to push back and change the environment when we can as well. And these are the things that go into the thinking as we set our priorities. I'll share with you a few things with regards to the strategic roadmap that the department's begun to work on. And the obvious, which I think relates to maybe even the School of Education or the institution at the moment, is a real need for us to re-examine agency priorities. In many ways, it's because we've got economic pressures that are coming in. We also have the need to address and deal with the pandemic. And so we've got to go through and make sure that we elevate the things that are extremely important. And these are not decisions that we make simply based on previous uh, um, information that we had as a department, but really take in all the elements that I shared with you that are influencing our context at the moment. We've got to restructure key functions and processes of the organization. We've begun to do this for some time with a lot of pilot projects and the aspiring to educate with Dr. Ulrich mentioned at the beginning is one example. This is going to give us feedback and recommendations of, of how we as a department need to make sure that we rethink our functions and processes to make sure that they continue to be conducive to allowing our institutional partners to be successful. We also re need to rethink our approach to work, work culture, and well-being. The pandemic has taught us one thing is that if we do move to remote approaches to work and learning, the whole system doesn't begin to crumble. In fact, we've got the ability to be able to adapt and make it work. And I think we've got to take some of those lessons to inform our thinking moving forward. The department has always struggled in Harrisburg to recruit a diverse composition of a workforce. In many cases, a lot of that has to do with geographic proximity and the way that the approach to work has happened in the past. We've seen that we've been able to engage effectively as a unit, even when folks are in places like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Erie, and other places around the Commonwealth, and they can still continue to engage our work. And we need to understand how we can adapt to that to improve at least our presence out in the Commonwealth and the community. Work culture and well being have become extremely important. When we think about reaching month number nine, from a remote working environment. I think same can be said about our institutions. You begin to understand how we are being affected by some of these changes and well-being, although it's always been something that's been a pronounced aspect, it has not been part of the traditional ideas of socialization and support at a place like the Department of Education and other agencies. So we're really gonna advocate to make that a strong part of the things that we put out in terms of priority and how we think about the important um, issues and concerns to highlight. We have to and we must reinvigorate our commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion, build on some of the things that we've done in the past, challenge ourselves not to allow the constraints from the economy to crowd out important issues such as diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly when the framework for measuring what gets invested is those things that generate revenue or uh, have a greater return on investment that sadly often these three ideas are never seen in the same light. And diversity, equity, inclusion must be seen as something that gets us back to the excellence that we strive for as a department and for our system of education. And then we need to reclaim the narrative about the benefits and outcome of education as well, which is something that we put on the slate as an important key imperative. And what I wanna sort of spend some time highlighting on as well. This to me is an important strategy that the department has that I think we need to really be responsible and represent to our uh, uh, educational stakeholders, stakeholders. For years now, we've seen the narrative of outcomes with education repurposed, reappropriated, and has gone to take on a meaning that's entirely different from some of the things that are deeply wedded to some of the mission and vision even imperatives that we have as institutions when we think about the outcomes that we strive for. And these are closely tied to the public good benefits and outcomes of education. Things that many of us know that the students going to the Drexel School of Education to the University of Drexel as well must have when they exit to become good and productive citizens in our society. And we need to make sure that that's not lost from the narrative. 
lots of emphasis has been played uh, or placed on talking about education as an individual private good with outcomes that benefit the individual, which I think are important. Social uh, well being, social pathways to the middle class, things that provide folks with access and benefits are not bad things to pursue an education for, but they're not the only outcomes that we have out there. And now more than ever, we need to begin to figure out how we're going to reclaim that narrative and those priorities. I tend to refer this to this as the public mission of higher education. What institutions have long stood for and represent and what they provide to our students and our young learners to be able to help them develop the cognitive scripts, the scaffolding, to understand and make sense of events, but more importantly, how they're going to contribute to what the pathway forward for success for us is going to look like. The disruptions from the pandemic are not just things that are upending our systems for a year or two. These are generational paths that have been upended that are going to affect society for years to come. There were a number of folks on a trajectory of education, you know, leading into the pandemic that was already precarious. Folks that were just coming into understanding of their own individual self-esteem, their academic self-esteem, and many of them who probably found themselves historically underrepresented in pathways to even post-secondary had those paths uh, rerouted. And many of them may never find their way back. And we need to figure out what we're gonna begin to do about that. We need to understand that much of what was required during the pandemic was about individuals being other oriented, thinking about the collective, understanding their role and responsibility as one individual to provide good for the others. And I think these are the things that are tied to the outcomes that I consider the public mission of higher education as well. Things like civic engagement, engaged citizenry, volunteerism, altruism, equity mindedness, being a global citizen, being environmentally conscious, other oriented, these are the things that the public mission of higher education needs to be about. And we've got to find a way as a department to encourage folks to understand that this is a critical element, a much needed element, and something that is a, as, a, as a sector we need to begin to understand in order for us to make any progress in being effective. When I think about this key entity into our overarching strategy as a department. So what I wanna to bring to you today in terms of the presentation to really give you a sense of how we're thinking about what the role the department needs to play and serve as we think about moving forward. A strategy based on discourse often is not seen as having all the uh, benefits and outcomes that would exist if we were going there and simply uh, take a strategy that looks at prioritizing key issues and uh, uh, advocating for investment. This is not to suggest we wouldn't do that simultaneously, but this is the idea that when we go in there and begin to think about some of the issues and concerns, we would certainly begin to repurpose them, reframe them within the goals of education. And once again, reiterate the importance that the our sector of education is going to, be, uh, is going to have to play as we think about what the pathway forward to a new, normalcy of education would look like. I often get asked in a number of the presentations that I make, what is the Department of Education? Uh, when are we going to get back to the normal that many of us were most accustomed to? And our response to that is often, we're not exactly sure we should be very quick to pivot to go back to things that were once considered normal because normal wasn't benefiting everyone before. Uh, when I hear folks attribute the fact that access to learning remotely is inequitable and it's not providing folks with the tools and resources needed to be effective learners and do well, learning was not accessible to a number of people. And access, whether it wasn't necessarily the tools to access remote learning in some communities, was non existent. The facilities were not there. The schools were not proper learning environments, and it's not because of the pandemic that we had uh, that schooling was disrupted. There were disruptions that existed before that many of us were trying to address, and we can't let that fall from the narrative as well. And so for us, these are the things that are going to be important as we think about the pathway forward. 
I'll stop there now to see if anyone might have any questions that I might be able to answer or just thoughts and reflections on what I shared today. Uh, Dr. Ulrich, I'm not sure if there's a way to facilitate a Q&A aspect or Eric as well, but I'm happy to sort of take the PowerPoint down and, and uh, look to see if there's a hand raising function that we could use. Sure, there is. And anybody's welcome to unmute their microphone and ask questions directly as well, as well as chat. So either. So Dr. Ortega, I'll jump in. My name is uh, Bruce Levine and I'm a clinical professor in the school. And I was pleased to see your, your slides about the public mission of, of education. I was just wondering, as you look at our school of education, um, how do you see us potentially uh, contributing, playing a supportive role to advancing that perspective either through um, well, I'll just leave it at that as an open-ended question. Yeah, and I appreciate I appreciate the question. Um, you know, I think that the School of Education has already begun to partner with the department on, in a number of areas, and I think I'd like to see the potential for more partnerships, particularly if we can find the way to nudge the General Assembly to invest even more in some of the efforts that have already been occurring. It's obvious to me that as we think about rebuilding our K through 12 systems in particular, educator preparation is gonna take on a whole new level of importance. We've already begun to have conversations that are informed by sort of previous lessons around culturally responsive learning, culturally responsive and sustainable education. I think embedded in that sort of umbrella uh, uh, idea is a number of other aspects in terms of competencies that are gonna be extremely important in moving forward. And I think with regards to what institutions can do in the preparation of young folks. I think that's gonna be an important aspect, particularly in the educator workforce. That's not exclusive to teachers, right? I think these are elements that have to find themselves into the school counseling realm, into the educational leader realm, and all the other folks tied to the ecosystem of education. In addition, I think the one area where trust has always uh, uh, been a challenge is in the partnerships that exist between our LEAs K through 12 and our institutions of higher education, right? Even more so I would add communities. Uh, you know, my experience in doing research around the public good and public good outcomes, I always had to step into context where there were inherited perceptions about our institution that had to be navigated before I could even begin to effectively build the infrastructure and capacity to be effective. And I often wish that there was an entity that would play a role in helping to facilitate and rehabilitate those uh, uh, relationships that was not the institution itself, right? That would benefit everyone that would like to be a partner in the future. And I think that's one area where a partnership between the agency and institutions can exist. Can we play a role in helping to bring the stakeholders to the table and work past some of the challenges that maybe were as a result of partnerships in the past and then rebuild that and create pathways moving forward. I don't think that schools are gonna to get to the next level without an effective partnership with institutions of higher education. And I think those two entities are not gonna to get to the next level without effective partnerships with the community and some of those community members who are there. And these are things that institutions of higher education have known and roles that they played for a very long time. And I think now is the time to sort of um, re-engage in those kinds of effective partnerships and see how then we can create a space for the agencies such as this one to be helpful in some cases. It's not exclusively to that. You know, I say that knowing that often we are the problem. You know, we are at the root of some of the challenges that exist. And I think if, if it's necessary for the, for the department to begin to rethink uh, how they approach the work, and I think that's also a necessary aspect. So I offer, Bruce, those three kind of ideas of, as a starting point, which I think are critical. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ahead. Ortego, um, I would like to, you know, ask you a couple questions because I think you're right on in terms of this idea of the new normal and going back in schools, attempting to maybe think they wanna go back, 
to this. And I've been a former superintendent of schools dealing with change process, et cetera. And I, what I'm hearing you say is that we have to address what this new normal is going to be. And I'm wondering, you know, what will be the um, PDE's approach to encouraging the change process that's gonna be necessary and to look at many times the constraints that bureaucracy puts in the way. So sure. I'm, I'm really curious about how, how you're going to promote this because I think it's gonna be very critical as sure. we go forward. I'll give you two uh, um, tangible examples, John, that I think are important to sort of shed light on, right? The first is around the way that we approach regulations and statute at the department. There's a real tendency to rely on what I think are antiquated ideas tied to time parameters, right? That move away from competencies. The idea that you have weeks and hours and days tied to law and in statute is a huge misstep by an agency. And that's a perfect example of how bureaucracies began to create artifacts that are huge constraints and don't recognize it, right? They often are quick to pivot to say, oh, you know, the problem here is investment. The problem here is this. You can infuse certain elements with a great increase in dollars and still not eliminate any of the regulations that are serving as the constraints and the barriers and need to rethink. So as a department, we've already begun to sort of call out the need to pivot away from things that are tying us to time parameters and move more towards the area where there's competencies and flexibilities in case, uh, because we're gonna continue to find ourselves in these kinds of situations. So that's one of them. The other is not to feel that it's really about um, creating new policy agendas. And one place where this is a really real uh, situation that is also an opportunity in the immediate uh, policy agenda, which is in the area of charter school reform. Uh, and so charter school reform is an interesting aspect because there's a lot of antecedents that go into understanding why the sector emerged, right? And I often relate the charter school area to the private license school element of post-secondary institutions. They share a lot of similarities, right? They're meeting a need. And in many cases, it's the need that public school systems have let certain communities down, right? Particularly, you see them in communities of color, which is a really interesting kind of framework to thinking about charter schools. But there's a space in the charter school agenda that to me has grown partic a particular interest, which is the virtual charter school space. It's a space that in many ways suffers from a great deal of quality assurance. Uh, and quality assurance has always been an agenda that I've always kept top of mind in higher education. Right? It's always been about the pursuit of quality. And, and in some ways, schools of education with the Department of Education, our relationship is around regulation and quality assurance, right? Which can't be said about all the other sectors at the institution. They don't have the same level of regulatory oversight. The private license school sector does. So going back to charter schools and virtual charter schools, We've seen an infusion of dollars come into the sector from the federal level and from the state to meet a need that was a result, a result of a discontinuity like the pandemic. And now you've got capacity and infrastructure where it previously didn't exist. And now there's the potential of partnerships where that collaboration can now happen with the post-secondary institution and a public school entity. And if a public school entity can find a way to step into the virtual space the online learning space, particularly if the need has been identified moving forward. Now there's a need to develop educators who exit with that ability. And then we find a way to use that as a way to improve the quality and the offerings of learning in that particular space. And then hope that that strategy has an influence with spillover diffusion effects into other parts of the educational sector. And for me, that represents a really interesting opportunity of how can we can rethink some things that we already have gained a lot of traction on, repurpose them slightly and create opportunities where new partnerships can exist. You know, and in many ways, whether the department is facilitating this, like this is happening. I've seen institutions in other states move very quickly, right? Before the catalyst was the need to generate revenue, which hasn't dissipated in any way. But now you've got another catalyst, which is the opportunity to, to really, uh, take advantage 
in a way that's respectful to the agency of some of the infusion that we've seen at the federal level with dollars. So John, I offer those kind of three points as kind of ways that we've been thinking about it and where we're getting ready to begin to articulate those strategy with institutions as well. So we have a question from Tracy in chat and her question is, what are some concrete tools that will be used in shifting towards a new, more equitable reality? What steps and processes, what involved will stakeholders in the field have? Sure. So uh, a few things that uh, we're beginning to do as a department for the purposes of, of addressing some issues around coherence, right? So often there's been a disconnect, not just with the agency and some of the partners that we have from like institutions and LEAs, but across other agencies in the department where there is shared work. Anytime that you have situations that we all face at the more moment where it's not just about doing more with less, but it's doing even more with even less, you have to figure out ways to create creative partnerships where you move back to, uh, where you move past some of those systemic barriers and begin to establish collaborations at the agency level and invite the stakeholders. So we've begun to sort of identify ways where we could create uh, 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 groups that come together around specific issues that are representative of all the sectors, right? And so in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, th this becomes extremely important. Uh, one of the challenges that I often recognize when going into a conversation about work around equity and inclusion, particularly with when it's framed around uh, diversity, is that we have to be very mindful that these have been priorities that folks community partners have been advocating for for a very long time, making a lot of progress in that particular area because the governor declares systemic racism as a priority, priority doesn't mean that the agency discovered that there's a diversity, equity and inclusion problem in our society. And so to approach it in that kind of framework is problematic. We can say it till we're blue in the face, but unless we find a way to enact it by inviting the individuals who have been doing the work in that area into the space, we're going to once again fall victim of that negative perception that often exists with agencies when they step into spaces where they don't necessarily own and they feel like they can move in there and own them. The work that we did with Drexel around aspiring to educate was premised on that idea. It was how can the state remain a partner on the periphery and allow those that were more engaged in the core of the issue to take the lead in the work. And then look to them for the lead and recommendations of what, what's gonna be the outcomes of that and then allow them to put together the script for what evaluation will look like. And then in turn, make it a part where recommendations to the department become a part of that, right? And that doesn't sound like a very novel idea in the higher education space, right? When we put that forward as an idea that resonated, I was surprised at how, how, much, how much it got in the way of accolades because I thought, why aren't we already doing that? Why is this a new discovery? The idea that the folks who are being most affected by the work are there. It's the ideas around community-based participatory research and ideas, right? Like it's been present in that area and it somehow has to make its way into the department as well. So that's a way that we're beginning to reach out with folks. We're also trying to find ways to invite folks who are experts in certain areas to be the leads in the work at the state level, right? An example of that would be, why does the department have fellowships that go out to folks for a year? where we could buy out the time of a faculty member, maybe during tenure, someone, who, someone who's looking for an opportunity to go there and put the work in their hands, allow them to go out and engage the stakeholders to write the information. I've seen philanthropic organizations do this all the time, right? From Lumina to Ford Foundation, we'll reach out to faculty folks and over uh, the course of a year, you put together recommendations that go to the organization and then investment is done that way. It's not a model that's so far removed that we couldn't embrace at the department, but that's just another example of some things that we're beginning to promulgate around this particular issue. Other questions? I'm trying to go back and forth with the chat, but I'm trying to stay present as well, and it's really dif difficult. I think Dr. James Connell had a question. Sure. Uh, Secretary Ortega, thank you for uh, speaking with us today. I really appreciated your opening um, remarks and comments and 
Um, I found your parallel description of the events that have been happening over the last couple of months really um, interesting and uh, um, and uh, and, and powerful and impactful. Um, so I've been working as a school psychologist. My PhD is in school psychology. I got it at that at LSU when RTI was being developed both at LSU and the University of Oregon. And then I went on to the May Institute to do my internship where I was participating in a OSEP um, dissemination site for PBIS. In addition to that, I have an uh, interdisciplinary behavioral health clinic in the School of Education where we do, do neurodevelopmental uh, disorder evaluations for their early intervention system in the city here. And so for the past 20 years, I have been serving teachers and students um, in urban environments um, and in neighborhoods where there is a high population of minority students or um, disenfranchised children and under-resourced communities where you see a significant amount of inequity in terms of access to educational opportunities, as well as access to effective behavioral health supports. And with a year now out of school, I'm curious how much support will be needed and how are we gearing up for that when you know, I'm hoping that we get back into the schools in the fall. Uh, there's gonna be a significant amount of support for many of our students to get, you know, caught up. And, you know, it's, it, it sort of weighs on me every day. The, you know, the, so I work with children with autism. I work with children with disabilities and I, I work with behavioral health systems. And we have a partnership with St. Chris Dorish Hospital for Children to do neurodevelopmental evaluations. And I know the types of supports that they are getting in the home and in the community it is, it is significantly reduced compared to previous supports. And so those children are going to be entering, as you know, AS classrooms and life uh, skills classrooms and general education classrooms. And they're going to need some support. And I'm, I'm sort of curious about like how the PA DOE is sort of thinking about ramping up their social workers or school psychologists or schools counselors, behavior analysts, as well as providing the general ed and special education teachers the, um, the resources and support they're gonna need to help uh, our children you know, meet the educational and behavioral needs of you know, the grade level that they're entering and, 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 and beyond, right? Yeah, and you know, you shed light on a number of things that also keep me and others up at night at the department as well, right? You know, and first beginning with like the simple acknowledgement that the resources needed to get to rehabilitate our schools don't exist at the schools, right? And I'm not talking about the tangible resources like dollars. I'm talking about the infrastructure in the personnel. They do not exist. If anything, the heterogeneity of resources has just created a bigger gap between the haves and the have nots. And the idea that a pandemic mitigation is heavily contingent on the resources that you have already suggested that those with benefits were gonna be the ones that were gonna be the least disrupted, right? So the disproportional impact of folks and young learners because of the pandemic is really, really, uh, a challenge. And it's going to be the same thing in the path backwards. So institu uh, uh, institutions and LEAs that have more resources uh, or have resources in abundance or access to those resources are going to be um, insulated from some of these impacts, right? Not entirely, because I think everyone's effective and, and effectively there's a lot of impact, but certainly are going to be able to um, reconfigure the structures, because they have the resources to invest in. And so I put that out there because I just want to acknowledge that I completely understand what you've put out as a context. What we're doing in the department is we're very quick to just go to different places to say, look, <clears throat> the ask around what's needed to rebuild the system of education does not, is not going to rest within the Department of Education. It's going to be, it's going to require the Department of Health to work more closely for us to find ways to to um, nudge partnerships at the local public health level 
and then to begin to set up pathways to build the infrastructure around the human capital piece. We created <clears throat> recently, and this is a work that we had been working on for a couple of years that was informed by a number of folks, but there's, there's a pathway to school certification uh, for counselors <clears throat> and social workers that we began to think about already. And so that is in place and we need to begin to elevate others uh, very quickly. And we want to do in a way, do it in a way that's mindful uh, of making sure that the quality remains in the field as well. And so we're beginning to think about what those, um, the translational pieces that can fit into the strategy exist, but it's gonna have to rely on identifying other stakeholders in communities where those things can happen. And then be comfortable with the fact that it's going to be a scaffolded step-in approach. We need to move quickly where we can and then not be bogged down by the fact that if we can't do it for everybody, that means we do it for no one. Got to start moving forward in some way to address those pieces and then begin to figure out how we could either lift resources, empower other areas and invest strategically to get there. Uh, but it's gonna require a level of decision-making that is going to be really uncomfortable for state agencies. But I think we need to grow, we, we need to understand that that's the, that's the environment that we're in. We're gonna have to figure out how to make the best of limited resources and then move forward. <clears throat> but what we should not do is create the perception that we're trying to resolve a problem when we know the investment is not at even many, meeting the minimal requirement, right? And so I think that's often a mistake that you've seen some of the states do right now with some of the infusion of federal dollars. You go in there and you give everyone $200 per FTE, which is, we're talking about a $15,000, $20,000 problem per FTE in some schools where that infrastructure doesn't exist, right? And we need to understand that that's kind of the lens that you need to, to, to use in these areas. Uh, and then just be comfortable with the fact that not everyone's going to be happy and we'll deal with some of the pushback, right? It's been interesting to me to see the biggest pushback in terms of resources come from some of our schools that before felt that they were benefiting from funding formulas and it was okay for those who were being affected uh, to continue to be affected because they're just, you know, it's just they did not control where the school was created and geography is not something you have some control over, which is a real shame. It's flipped with federal resources as they're coming in now. And it's interesting, the folks that are coming talking about inequities in the distribution of resources. And I think, well, there was a response that you were giving to people in the past. And unfortunately, we're going to go in there and start with the most disadvantaged and then begin to build our way up. Um, and that's just the approach that we have to take, right? And I share it with you all just in full disclosure. It's the thinking that's happening, right? And it's not a zero sum game. Like, I think that's how it's being framed in the public narrative. That's not what it is. It's really about trying to address, James, what you just laid out as the key issues. And it's really what we're trying to do in terms of directing resources. Dr. Ulrich, I'm looking at the time. I just want to be respectful of everyone who came here today. And I just want to offer a few things in terms of closing remarks and thanks. Uh, what I've given you today is, I'm not even sure if it aligns with the previous Dean's uh, lecture series. It was my opportunity to come in here and share with you an orientation, a framework to how priorities are being set at the department. Give you a sense of what the leadership transition is going to look like and how framing of issues will begin to look like as we move forward. A lot of this is not just me and my approach, it's the team that surrounds me who all share a very similar approach. If anything, the pandemic has taught us that the one thing that we do have some agency over is our time and our ability to be present and immediate to our partners. And that's something that we need to continue to do for the purposes of being there and allowing ourselves to collectively make sense of what's beginning to unfold and minimize some of the uncertainty and ambiguity surrounding a lot of the expectations that are coming our way. It's gonna be challenging, but I firmly remain optimistic that I think we're gonna see, we're gonna see a paradigm shift with regards to how thinking is done around priorities at the state and federal level. I don't think that the two uh, uh, political contexts are perfectly aligned. 
I think we're, our job as an agency is to figure out how we might be able to gain some ground at the federal level to influence and ensure that there are no constraints at the state level that keep the funds from going into the places that we just talked about today. And then that's one of the things that we just have to do is it's our role as a state agency to do those things and make sure that the entire time we understand that it's about creating the conditions to allow you to be successful. The questions that, you're, uh, that you pose at me with regards to what does innovation look like, I'm a product of understanding the contributions that post-secondary institutions make to society. And it's not the job of the state to get in the way of those contributions. Those are things that need to happen at the level where the expertise exists. And it's my intention to make sure that that's the narrative that plays out at the state level, right? I think I'm one of the first few education uh, nominees for secretary that comes from a post-secondary background. I intend to leverage that completely. It's important that that becomes part of the narrative. It's not about one sector over the other, but about the interplay between the two and how the two working together are going to be the only way that we can be effective as a society. So you can expect that as well from me. Uh, and I've been saying it publicly at each of the confirmation uh, hearings that I've had to take. Dr. Ulrich, with that, I turn the mic back to whoever it is and just thank you everyone for taking some time out of your day to meet with me, appreciate it. Secretary Ortega, thank you so much for being here. Um, sorry, we didn't get to all the questions. Great questions. Um, you, have, you have certainly um, stirred a spirit here in, in the conversation. So thank you, thank you for your insights. Thank you for sharing your, your approach to the agenda setting for your focus on the partnerships, for your focus on building the, the trust within relationships between the different sectors, and um, certainly the focus on the public mission. We, we, we appreciate all that you've shared with us. And again, taking time out of your very, very busy schedule. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Have and a good rest of the day. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Very good talk.